Hi, this is Nancy L.T. Hamilton. Welcome back to my studio. Today, which this, what we're doing today, won on Facebook for the most uh, votes, and it's going to be on making cuff bracelets. It's a very exciting subject, and uh, I think you're going to learn a lot, and I'm going to do something stupid, I'm sure, and we're going to get started. Our big boy Ralphie has joined us. He's not going to stay long. Um, what I want to talk about now is are the uh, cuffs themselves. You know, they make bracelet blanks, and a lot of people tend to just make bracelets um, cuffs that look like that. They or they might put a little pattern on it or something like that. But they don't. They don't take it that extra step further. And there's so many different metals you can use besides brass and copper and silver um, like these aluminum blanks right here are awesome uh, for, they're cheap you, you don't you can buy tons of them for very little money hold on let me get rid of Ralph so he's a cat in my house I got rid of him the whole thing was about food he was hungry again can number nine so anyway back to seriousness here um, what I was saying was, that, you know, you got to take your design places and push it a little bit and think about new ways to do a band of metal. What can you do with it? Like on this one, I took um, a piece of aluminum and a piece of brass and just cut out the shapes and riveted it together. You know, it just changed the whole cuff. They were both at one point brass and uh, aluminum uh, bracelet blanks. The little texturing, blah, blah, blah. Um, this one is pierced and also has a lot of decorative elements. Piercing, make sure you use very thick metal because all these, all this piercing, leaving all that negative space makes it rather weak and it can bend instead of curve when you're forming the piece. Um, this one is just simply patterned, but I'm making little hook, uh, hooks here to hook this other element on top of it to add some interest and may end up adding another, a, a bezel back here. And this is just an experimental piece that I did a, um, what do you call it, mock-up of to see if it would work. Um, I would probably end up doing this in silver if I was going to do it. And these are other people's work, <coughs> the other ideas. You know, this is kind of like in sugars, like we did on uh, the video with sugar on the fusing silver. You know, melt some silver, cut it up, bang it around. This is uh, anodized aluminum. Oh, nice little fold there. You know, just a simple cuff pattern, but nice little bend. Uh, this is from a friend who I went to the jewelry school with, and it needs to be reshaped. But she just put these elements in the dapping block and pounded them out uh, to make a much more interesting cuff. And this is, a, I think, a commercially available one. But it has a really interesting shape and cut out. Um, so, you know, think, think far, think, think wild, think. <laughs> so I'm going to kind of give you some ideas on how to design your own in a little bit. Okay. So, now I want to talk about the tools a little bit before I go into the design. Um, the two big things you need on shaping a bracelet is our either something to form it over, well you need something to form it over, period, and something to whack it with to, to, to have the metal conform to the shape of the thing you're hammering on. Now if you look at a side view of a wrist, or if I cut my hand off, which I'm not going to, and look down, my, my arm is oval, it's not a circle. So they sell a lot of these round mandrels, bracelet mandrels, which are great for some things, but um, I, you know, maybe bangles would be good for this. Uh, for a cuff, I tend to like to, oh, I like to go with, <laughs> this one's going to kill me, the oval bracelet mandrel. Um, and this thing is huge and heavy and expensive, but you can kind of make your own if you're in a pinch or you you don't have any money or you don't want to invest in it because you're not sure if you want to do it, there's things you can do. Now this one's commercially available and it's actually for glass bead makers, uh, I guess to make glass bracelets on, 
but it works great as a stand to form a, a bracelet on. And you can also stick this part into your vise to hold it steady or even screw it down onto a piece of wood. So, and these were, oh, I can't remember, maybe $20 or something. They're not great, but they're, they're better than nothing. Um, this one is a fancy piece of PVC that I stuck in my toaster oven at about 325 for, I don't know, five minutes. And then I just kind of, gent with, with leather gloves on, kind of squished it down. Um, I also had really good ventilation because this stuff puts off not toxic fumes. So don't overheat it and, and definitely ventilate well. But this is a great little forming tool right here because it's hard as heck and easy to shape. Um, another idea, this is an axe handle um, that I massacred and I actually made a little uh, drilling block for it. So when I want to do rivets, I have a holder f uh, for drilling. This is just a piece of wood, a dowel, drilled two holes, stuck some wood glue in there and voila! <laughs> um, I've heard of people using baseball bats and things like that. So I tried a can because I advised a couple people to check out using a can, but cans are big and maybe you get a little, what's that stuff called? Oh my god. You use it to make it spaghetti, it's thick. Tomato paste. Maybe a small can like that would work. You could also fill a can with cement or something like that. Anyway, um, that's what I want to talk about on the mandrels, and then I'm going to pull the hammers out, and we can talk about those. So on to our little hammers here. I have Daddy Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. So a hammer, mallets, um, these are leather. Some people have made them from dog chews and a dowel. I was too lazy to do that. But you want to have something that's not going to mar your metal from the exterior when you're forming it around around the the block. So that's why we use leather, wood, or in this case, uh, this is urethane, and this is made by Bonnie Dune. Um, use you want something with a nice softer head to, uh, to shape it because this is just moving the metal to mimic the form that it's being hammered over. So. Mm -hmm. I do use um, my chasing hammer or, or other hammers, especially if I want to do a pattern. And the mandrel is really nice to keep it on because then you've got that steel back on it. It doesn't crush the piece and you can still put your pattern on. The edge too. Um, so this is only used if you want to do texturing and things like that. Or if you want to rivet on top of here, that's another thing you can do. is. Um, if you like, I riveted the flowers on that one cuff, or this cuff where these pieces are are riveted on. I did it on on the bracelet mandrel and employed this hammer, my chasing hammer. So that's that on the hammer. So those are the two basic tools you need: and a torch of some sort to anneal your metal. Um, I'm going to show you how to anneal aluminum in a little bit because it's a, a low melt metal and has and also has toxic fumes so we need to do something very careful. I have to go back a little bit. I forgot that I wanted to talk briefly about blanks and, um, and making your own blanks. Um, these are some of the commercially available blanks. Some come with pre-rounded edges. Some don't. You can get them thin, thick. You can get them actually like almost bangle size. Um, and the other thing is, if you're going to cut your own, you can use a um, like a guillotine shear or a um, some kind of like a. It depends on how thin or thick the metal is. But if you're working with 18 gauge or something like that, you might want to saw it out with your jeweler saw. Uh, you could use like tin aviator tin snips or something like that to try cut it out. But you're going to have rough edges. That, you will be doing some filing on. So we'll talk about more of that later after I show you how to make one on your own. Okay. So uh, designing or laying out if you're not buying pre-made uh, blanks. Um, the first thing you want to do is figure out your size. Most of these blanks that you can buy are 15 to 16. I just use a piece of paper and do the old wrap. <laughs> wrap and mark. My mark is right there. So with a cuff, you're going to use less material um, 
so see this is 16.5 so I'd probably take five millimeters off of this for my cuff um, the more you make the more you will figure out what size exactly you need for yourself but everybody of course is going to be different that's why it's nice that there's always something goes on the far always that's why they're open you know so you can make them a little shorter one uh, note if you're going to pattern in a rolling mill uh, after you cut your stock out you might want to make it even a little shorter especially if you're working with a precious metal because it's going to stretch quite a bit in the rolling mill um, it also stretch if you're going to do some hand forging on it too so some hand uh, texturing with a hammer so take that into consideration but the you know like I said most of them run around 15 to 16 centimeters so what you want to do um, is now that you have your wrist width um, I'm going to make this probably 15.5 because I'm not going to do too much on it as far as um, roll. I'm not going to roll it through the rolling mill. This is bronze. Bronze and brass are really good materials for making cuffs because they're springy and they're strong. Sterling silver is really good for argentium. Fine silver is tough because it's so soft that it can come out of shape a lot and then the person ends up squeezing it back on and squeezing it back on and it tends to crack uh, with fine silver. Aluminum's awesome. You can do tin. Um, and stainless steel is possible. A lot of these have limitations on whether you need to solder something on or attach elements with rivets, like with the aluminum or tin or stainless steel. You'll have to use some kind of cold connection instead of a soldering mechanism. So now the next thing you need to decide is how wide do you want to make this cuff. So I'm just going to make a thin one here. And if possible, have a machined edge to start on. If I started on this edge, I'd have a lot more cleanup on that and probably this side. So I like to take advantage of, of these machined edges. And these cuffs run, how many are they? One, two, three. They're almost um, 40 millimeters or four centimeters. So you can do whatever width you want. I'm just going to make this 30. And basically you're just going to mark out your 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 width there. You can use the triangle if you want to be really nice and line this edge up. Um, and I worry about the length after I do this part. <clears throat> then you want to go ahead and determine, let's say we're doing 15.5. Is that what I said? I don't even remember. I'll do 15 because it's just the end of the ruler I have here. It's perfect. And I'm not too concerned about it being exact because this isn't involving an exact fit and it is going to change its shape somewhat, somewhat because I'm going to have, um, with the forming, it's going to take up some of the length of it and also clean up and rounding the edges will also take some of the length from it too. And you can always stretch it out uh, on your mandrel later if it's a little too short. This is very much like making a ring shank. Very much. <coughs> Excuse me, I am sick, so I'm going to blame all my flaws today <coughs> and faults on being ill. <coughs> Sorry, just feeling sad. Sorry for myself. Okay, so I, what I'm going to do now is cough, <coughs> um, and then I'm going to cut this on my shear over here. So I'm going to get up and and get presentable for that. So here I am at my little throatless shear from Harbor Freight and this is not the most accurate of things but it does cut um, thick metal like this 18 gauge. I don't know if I mentioned that already. You want to 18 to 20 gauge is a good gauge for making these bracelets but I have noticed that some of the aluminum ones are like 22 and they're kind of okay because they're so springy and hard and it's hard to they, they hold their shape really well as does brass and bronze silver I would definitely a sterling silver even I would do eight, uh, 18 and of course you can always add layers like I did with that one bracelet and then you can use two two thinner layers of metal together to make uh, a thicker bracelet. So now we've got this thing cut out and it's not quite lined up but um, I'm going to show you how I'm going to straighten this up in a second. 
So now that I've got this warped mess, um, I don't know if you've seen my other videos, but this is basically a standard practice for straightening out. I've got a piece of wood and I can either put the wood over the top and bang that or I can bang the metal itself. I'm not going to stand here and bang it because it, it, it'll, I can't talk. <laughs> I don't like that. But once I get this flat, I may have to kneel this because this is 18 gauge bronze and it's pretty hard metal. So I may have to kneel this and then once I get this nice and flat, then I'm going to do the straightening and the edge cleanup. I don't have to remember, I don't have to do it on this side and one of these corners, I think this corner, because I already did that um, by using the manufactured edge on the metal. Uh, but I like these big hand files. This is a double cut. And what I do is I just drag down the surface until I don't see um, little spots anymore on the side. I also check the measurement. I'll measure from here to this edge and make sure that it's evenly filed. And then I'll switch to a single cut. And these big ones are great because you have a lot more room to pull down and they're wide enough that you're not trying to balance them off this on here. Um, this is standard cleanup for um, a standard shaped one. This flattening part you'll probably do, even if the uh, you're going to do the fancy one that I'm going to show you next. So um, it's just general jewelry making stuff. So we're going to talk a little bit about putting uh, designs together and changing the shape of a blank or cutting your cut metal next. So if you're going to make a lot of cuff bracelets, you can make yourself a, like a plastic template, um, maybe do a couple different sizes. So on this paper, what I've done is I've drawn a basic um, wider ring cuff, I mean ring cuff, <laughs> bracelet cuff, and um, I've made it the right length and all that doodah. This is a this little design up here is actually from something you might use for wall decoration or you know spray paint and stuff. I just stalled this part up here. Um, but if you were like freehanding your design, I actually have a video. I wrote it down because I won't remember. It's called Creating Patterns for Jewelry Designs. Uh, when I do these on the vi on the video that I made by myself without Lisa, um, I will only draw half of a pattern. And then um, on my on the software program that does editing, um, I flip it over, and so this might be a cutout area in here. So at least that way the pattern would be the same on both sides, unlike this drawing. So that could be a pierced element in there. <clears throat> if you want to change your external shapes, you know you can employ these gigantic <laughs> circle templates, but you can pull in a line like that. And you can either keep this as square edge or you can roll it around by hand like that. You might want to mimic it on the other side and go in the opposite direction. The nice thing about having a template is that you can do a bunch of designs quickly by having um, the template already done so you don't have to keep measuring this out all the time. So you, so you can take, you know, you can go berserk, do whatever. Dot, dot, smile face. <laughs> tongue hanging out. Um, you know, you're, you're just limited by, by your imagination at this point. You can actually make a cuff that's longer, that kind of comes and has a tongue like that. And that what that would do would be to wrap around, like, let's see if I can draw it upside down. So here's the tongue. You know how hard this is? This is difficult. So you could do something like this, where the tongue from one side this part here comes and wraps around, maybe stick a rivet in there, or put a little hook here and a loop. Um, there's tons of stuff you can do with the design and, and so you don't just have to keep it as a rectangle all the time. Um, people also like to add bezels to these and that's um, something that I'm going to talk about. I think I should talk about it now since I'm already talking about it. <laughs> um, let me whip these out. So. <coughs> Generally, I like to add my raised elements, uh, bezels, or little settings like this after I've already shaped the bracelet because shaping the bracelet involves hammering on this metal. And if you have a nice tiny 
little bezel sitting on here and you whack it, get back up there, you whack it with a hammer, you're going to end up with a flat bezel. So usually these elements are added later. Um, one thing that these little bezels fit great pretty much anywhere, you know, anywhere I put it, it's going to have full contact with the base onto the metal here. But when you get into these bigger settings, you'll notice that because of the curvature of the bracelet, this is going to sit off the cuff uh, in certain areas. Now you might decide that that's okay. Um, you might also decide that what you want to do is flatten, like if you're going to have it in the center, you can actually flatten this area in here so your cuff looks more like this. So you've got a flat area on top. Oh, that's a good drawing. And so your bezel would sit up here. So generally it's easier on you to do a smaller bezel. You could do a series of smaller bezels. You know, if you if you wanted to achieve the same look. Like, you know, the round stuff's really fun. Everything just likes to roll off. But I could do like a series of three or four down here and have them have better contact. Having that gap show is not necessarily a great thing. I guess it's frowned upon somewhat, but I'm in, I'm a believer in do whatever the hell you want as long as you're happy with it. You know, it's not all it's not all about money, really. It isn't. Um, but you know, this this would be this is tough. So what I did? Where did that dang bracelet go? I'll be right back. What's a video out without me running away, finding something I left? So it's like this one. This is a huge stone. And it was definitely sitting, hanging in the air. I don't know if you can see that, but that's just hanging in the air. And I wanted a lot. This is backless. I would not have a backless on here. Because you need all the surface area you can get that contacts with this. So what I did was I actually made the bezel and ground away the sides, the edge of it, and made a round shape. I used a half round file for this. And then because it still looked really janky, I put a little piece of trim around to co cover the gap. You know, there's no rule that says I can't do that. As long as this thing is on here, which it is, because I shaped it, it's, I can think of it like the bezel was shaped like this. So my stone is here. And I, I actually cut into the bezel so that it could sit on the, the hump of the bracelet, the curve of the bracelet there. God, I'm so good at this upside down drawing. Let's start a career. Um, so there are ways to work around using these big stones. Um, but like I said, it's a lot easier to do the, the smaller bezels with it. You can also try um, curving your bezel. The problem is, then you get uh, is my stone gonna look hang in the air? So you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Just ignore that. <laughs> um, so yeah, you got to be creative about it. And there are other ways to do it. Um, you can also change the base of your stone with with lapidary equipment so that it reflects the shape of the piece that you're working on, or use inlay or a little mosaic to mimic that curve. So there are ways around it. I mean, look at some of the Navajo jewelry. They have their big stones and, you know, that would be a good thing actually to research a little bit is go and check out some Navajo jewelry. So um, I'm going to start talking about, um, I'm going to go through annealing aluminum next and forming the bracelet around the mandrel. So we're going to do that.